Tonight, I will focus on one major challenge for Singapore, which is the widening income gap, and discuss several issues which are related to this. Education, the ageing population, and housing. We know why the income gap is widening. We've discussed this many times. You've read all about it in the papers. Globalization, technology, and cutthroat competition. This is the way the world is going, and Singapore is getting carried along with it. So if we look at the spectrum, at the lower end, hundreds of millions of unskilled workers in China, India, Vietnam, and there will be other countries too, entering the global workforce, holding down wages. In the middle to higher end, where you have skills, secretaries, clerks, professionals, IT is automating simple jobs. You don't need a typist anymore. You need an office manager. So the premium is on education and skills, simple things which the computer or the robots can do if you're competing against a robot, you're in trouble. You have to have skills and the ability to do things and think and the knowledge to do things which the computers and robots cannot do. So the premium on education has gone up sharply. Somebody did a study in Singapore and we found that for every year longer you go to school, you can expect your wages to go up by 14%. So six years in school, then when you go to poly or university, the increase is even steeper for university education, per year of education. So the premium on education is very high and the ladder is there and is steepening. But this goes all the way to the top. And at the very top of the distribution, there's fierce competition. In all fields, in sport, if you want to watch golf, you want to see Tiger Woods. Or if you want to watch tennis, you want to see Roger Federer. They're the best. If you're a company hiring a CEO, you want the best candidate. And you will try very hard to get the best candidate. Because the second best candidate, if he costs your company half a percent in profits, for a big company, that may be several million dollars. So you try hard to get the best. If you are looking for a lawyer to fight your legal case for you, you will want to go for the best lawyer, not the cheapest one. So the result is winner takes all. The top incomes are zooming up. The second highest incomes, the gap is widening. So it's not just between the top and the middle, but even at the top, it's stretching out. Tiger Woods earns 100 million US dollars a year, prizes and endorsements. The number two player in the world. Most people here won't know who is the number two player in the world, which is the point. He's Jim Furyk. He earns much less. And the number two earner in the world who is Phil Mickelson, he earns about half of Tiger Woods. So even at the top, between number one and number two, the gap widens. The best and the rest. So at the bottom, in the middle, at the top, incomes are stretching out. But there's one more reason why income gap worries us, and that is the ageing population. Many of the poor people are likely to be elderly, and even working people who are not poor, if they have not provided enough for their old age, when they retire and they have no source of income, when their savings run out, they will become poor and will face difficulties. So this is what's happening to us. It's happening all over the world to develop economies. What can we do about it? The first overall strategy is to grow our economy generate the resources to tackle these problems, to help those in need. Without resources, you can talk, you can sympathize, you can feel the pain, 
you can't solve the problem. Aging is a very difficult problem to solve. There are no easy solutions, but I'll talk about this later at length. For the income distribution at the lower end, we emphasize training, skills upgrading, job redesign, so as to raise the productivity of low-income workers, get them to be able to get into better jobs, better paying jobs, help them to earn more. And this is what NTUC is doing through job redesign. In addition to this, we have programs like Workfare, where we transfer to the low income, but not without conditions, just as a Hong Pao. On condition you work, you make the effort, well, I'm prepared to match you, and I will help to top up your savings a little bit towards your take-home pay, but if you make the effort, we will make your life, help make your life better. So at the bottom, we have a strategy. At the top, it's good that people are doing well. The incomes may look large, but we cannot hold these incomes down, nor can we levy higher income taxes to tax them away. Because if you try to do that, particularly in a small and open country like Singapore, the talent will leave, the economy will lose vitality, many others will suffer. And right now we are prospering because we have brought income taxes down, because we have welcomed talent, because we have attracted businesses which come here and thrive in Singapore. So they've done well for themselves and our economy has boomed. 110,000 jobs created first half of this year. But although we can't force the incomes down or tax them away, those who have succeeded have to show that they care for their fellow citizens. For example, through philanthropy. It's happening in the US. A lot of the new wealth, people who are rich, instead of just spending it or living extravagant lifestyles, they are setting up foundations, doing good works. And here too, many Singaporeans are donating generously to good causes. So our universities, NUS, NTU, SMU, they have received contributions, donations for endowments to many projects. And the universities have a scheme to have endowed professor professorships, so professorships named after people. And we've collected contributions, they have collected contributions widely. Groups have mobilized in order to pass the hat around. And between the universities, they have nearly 80 endowed professorships. I think the contributions add up to a few hundred million dollars. So Singaporeans have been making these donations, small ones and a few big ones too. Sometimes we have buildings and faculties named after the donors or after the, uh, the foundations. So we have the Lee Kong Tian School of Business in SMU. NUS has the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. And we've got hospitals named after people. Tan Tok Singh from long ago, recently, the Ku Teik Pot Foundation has made a very generous donation. So Yishun will have the Ku Teik Pot Hospital coming up soon. And others like Mr. Sim Wong Hu have also made generous donations. 